Welcome on behalf of the Inter-American Development Bank. We wish to extend to you the most cordial welcome to this uh, virtual webinar on uh, integrity challenges for the private sector during COVID-19, the importance of uh, codes of corporate conduct uh, during and after the crisis. This uh, conversation will have interpretation services and you can find the services, uh, interpretation services all the way to the bottom on an icon of the globe. Now I'd like uh, to welcome Fabrizio, manager of the integration and trade sector of the Inter-American Development Bank. Fabrizio Peretti, welcome. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Fabrizio Perti. I'm the manager of the integration and trade uh, sector of the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank. And I'd like to start off uh, by thanking uh, Tamara Laj, uh, Nancy Wabi, Eduardo Wabi, a colleague in uh, the business dialogue, Eduardo Herrera, all those who've been with us uh, so that we can kick this off on the integrity challenges of the private sector during the pandemic, uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I would also like to thank uh, the joint work uh, done with my colleagues, Lea Jimenez, uh, Roberto de Michele, and all the other members of the division and the Transparency and Integrity Cluster at the bank. It's a pleasure to work with you, and we greatly value your willingness to cooperate with the Business Dialogue of the Americas. As you know very well, or as some of you know, the Business Dialogue of the Americas is an initiative headed by the private sector in the region and facilitated by the IDB, which promotes an exchange, high level exchange, with governments, uh, with uh, communities, uh, and challenges uh, for economic growth uh, and employment generation and obviously development and on public policies uh, that uh, are fed by the business community precisely to attain those objectives. The dialogue acts, acts as a consultation mechanism with the private sector for the process of the Summit of the Americas in 2018 when Peru hosted the summit. The issues of transparency and integrity received a thematic central attention by governments in the region. Then the recommendations that stemmed from the business dialogue that covers areas such as different areas as energy, funding of infrastructure, human capital, digital trade, and regional integration. But at that time, they mainly concentrated on the integrity agenda, integrity and transparency. Thus, the business dialogue acknowledged in its document that the commitment of the private sector is key in order to develop and create greater transparency in the region that constitute a central element in order to reach sustainable economic growth and improve lives in the Americas. And it also pointed out that the causes and effects of corruption are not limited exclusively to the public sector or the private sector. In fact, it has to do with an issue of a shared responsibility that calls for a joint solution. And stressing that this principle guides at the recommendation of the America's Business Dialogue in order to develop greater transparency and the best regulatory practices in the Americas. On the issue that brings us here today, the business dialogue recommended, and I quote, to give incentives to the private sector so that it would adopt comprehensive mechanisms in order to protect the integrity, including the codes of corporate con conduct, together with an effective implementation and a periodical review of compliance plans. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought with it new challenges also on issues of transparency and integrity linked to the urgent context where these processes are taking place, procurement and hiring, and that lead to procedures of exception or less careful reviews and those oppose uh, opportunities for less uh, transparent or corrupt practices. The business dialogue of the Americas and the recommendations it brought to the attention of governments in the region in order to respond to the pandemic, the dialogue met together the different working groups in the midst of the pandemic, and we developed 17 recommendations that were sent to each one of the ministers of finance in the region. 
that are the governors before the Inter-American Development Bank. And therein, it was pointed out that governments ought to continue maintaining the highest ethics standards, transparency and integrity during and after the pandemic, and that it is essential to maintain the highest levels of integrity and transparency in the process of and throughout the entire procurement process, in particular, and very much in particular, for contracts that are related to pandemic, um, because of the lives of the citizens in the region are at stake here. And the IDB added that the ADB added that, that the close coordination between the governments and the private sector is essential in order to make sure that this will be attained. And it underscored that uh, considering the central role of uh, medicine in order to deal with the health of patients during this crisis, it is also essential for governments, industry, professionals, and suppliers of health services, as well as all stakeholders uh, to strengthen their coordination in compliance uh, with the principles of Bogota adopted in 2017 and received uh, by ministers during the third business summit of the Americas. This virtual meeting today offers us an opportunity to ponder upon this uh, critical issue as a response to the pandemic. Thus, we contribute to, in order to make sure that public resources will be exclusively and adequately used in order to take care of the urgent health uh, and economic needs of the population. And in particular, on the essential role that the private sector can and ought to play and ought to perform in this effort. I thank you once again for your participation to all of you at this meeting that is completely aligned with the objectives of the America's Business Dialogue. And I now give the floor to Alia Jimenez, head of the Innovation Division, to serve the citizens, citizen services of the IDB, who will moderate the conversation amongst our distinguished participants. And thank you very much for your time. Leah, please. Liam, Division Chief, Innovation in Citizen Services Division. It's a pleasure to hear you, Fabrizio, and to hear the enthusiasm that comes out of you because we're all really excited in connection with this agenda that we promote jointly amongst all of us. And the conversation today is, in fact, a result, as Fabrizio said, of a process where we see the private sector together with the public sector and from the Inter-American Development Bank, we are involved because we understand that the issue of integrity is a shared responsibility amongst all. Since 2012, the America's Business Dialogue brings together big and medium-sized and small companies that work together with the goal to improving trade and investments in the regional integration that is so necessary for our countries. And the ultimate objective of all of this is to promote uh, sustainable development. And uh, precisely within the framework of this effort, uh, an important stepping stone that of this conversation was the option in Lima, as Fabrizio mentioned, of the Plan of Action for Growth. This happened in 2018. And in that plan, we included uh, a whole set of recommendations on policies that were adopted by consensus uh, in that group. And for the first time since uh, the business dialogue was created, a working group on transparency and integrity was included. But aside from this, uh, the recommendations on these uh, policies were stressed and considered as a strategic and they were prioritized in that document. And for us and the practitioners who've been working on these issues for many years, this in fact represents a significant acknowledgement, a collective acknowledgement that without transparency and integrity, there's no investment and we will not have a sustainable and inclusive development. And we all know what the dilemmas of integrity are and the ethical dilemmas that, that have always existed. Furthermore, on times such as those that we face today, where we see a huge need for making decisions, really major decisions of great impact, decisions that have to be made quickly, speedily. And this takes place not only in the public sector and in the private sector, but we also see it in multilateral organizations. All of us are facing critical times and times for decision-making. And it is precisely within this context that today's discussion is concentrated on how to face those dilemmas with responses such as these codes of corporate conduct. We want to hear from you. 
these codes of corporate conduct, are they useful? Do they work the way we thought they would work when we designed them? What have we learned in the last few months after this entire crisis? And what can we done better in the future so that these tools will work better? Our division, the Innovation in Citizen Services Division, has been working with uh, several of the panelists uh, here present on specific uh, transparency and integrity recommendations for this uh, plan for growth. And we share with them the enthusiasm in uh, working on this issue. I have to say that these are panelists with a well-known path in the CV, and we are sure that each one of them uh, will bring something interesting to this discussion. And without wasting any more time, I'd like uh, to kick off this conversation with one first round of questions, general questions, for all those, um, and I want you to answer from each one of your fields of expertise. And starting with the following question, which ones are you believe uh, are the challenges that we face on integrity that are being faced by businesses and companies because of the current crisis? And do you believe that these challenges are different from those uh, that are seen in normal times? And if so, why and uh, how? I'd like uh, to ask uh, Nancy, then Tamara Welby, Welby, and then Eduardo. So please, Nancy. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure for me to be uh, joining you today. Uh, many thanks to the Inter-American Development Bank uh, for organizing this event and for the America's Business Dialogue. Uh, the work that you've just described to advance transparency and integrity throughout the region um, is um, very important and very impressive. Uh, my name is Nancy Travis. I'm the Vice President for Global Compliance and Governance at AdvaMed, the Advanced Medical Technology Association. Um, AdvaMed is an association, uh, an industry association that represents medical device and medical equipment manufacturers. Uh, many of our companies have worldwide activities, um, so we also have um, a global uh, remit in terms of uh, the things that we work on. We've been working with the America's Business Dialogue uh, for the past several years, and uh, most re we most recently um, formed um, the Latin or the Inter Americas Coalition for the Support of Business Ethics in the Medical Technology Sector. It's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but it brings together associations of uh, med tech companies throughout the Americas region, and that. Um, coalition was what produced the Bogota principles that were just mentioned at the outset. Um, I know I'm not supposed to talk about um, all the details of that right now. I'm, I will answer your question. Um, I think um, the answer to your question, uh, like so many things, is a little bit of both. Um, the challenges for integrity in the current crisis, uh, I follow many of the same themes that we've already seen, uh, but some of those have been exacerbated. Um, in the medical technology sector, um, we have very, our companies have very close relationships with doctors and other healthcare practitioners in terms of um, how they prescribe and how they bring equipment um, into the healthcare settings. Um, and those uh, relationships have been challenged because of the social distancing and um, the fact that we can no longer communicate in person. And sometimes those challenges can create um, incentives for creative solutions that might actually violate some of the codes of conduct that we have developed. Um, we also are seeing um, a lot of pressure to acquire equipment very rapidly. Um, some um, governments have decided to um, reduce um, the regulations surrounding that procurement. Um, some have gone to single source suppliers. Uh, companies feel um, they have a great incentive to supply this equipment quickly because they want to help um, address the healthcare crisis. Um, also, you know, the costs and the prices being charged have fluctuated. Um, new entrants have come into that supply chain, um, entrants that may not be governed by the codes of conduct. Um, all of these things have created a very challenging environment. So we see the same kinds of pressures we've always seen, but we see them being exacerbated. Um, one of the things that we have done um, to address these challenges is we very quickly convened um, a teleconference of our association partners within the uh, coalition to discuss these challenges and see what we can do to get out in front of them. And um, one of the results of that was a statement that we released um, on April 2020, um, which just uh, acknowledges the 
importance of the medical equipment industry and the importance of the medical equipment um, to addressing the crisis, but also um, absolutely affirms the principles of the Bogota um, Agreement, um, where uh, we agree to uphold the highest standards of integrity um, in the medical technology sector. And um, we also supported the call of the ADP, um, which was actually on the same day, um, that all of the stakeholders uphold and promote the ethical standards. And I do agree with the statement that uh, was made earlier that um, we have a shared responsibility for corruption. We have a shared responsibility for addressing it. So uh, what we've done so far is to reiterate that the, the standards that have always applied do apply. Even though we are in a crisis, there is a state of emergency. It does not mean that the standards of integrity are suspended. In fact, the only way to have a positive outcome really is to reinforce those standards of integrity. Um, we have worked through our association partners um, to work with our member companies to ensure that they are continuing to follow um, those principles. Um, but um, we continue to monitor the situation. And um, one of the biggest challenges, I will say, is what we've come to call the uh, non-member dilemma, because we have new entrants coming into our field, um, reaching them with our codes of conduct and um, giving them the incentive structure to align with those codes of conduct um, continues to be a challenge. And I look forward to talking with my panelists about ways to address that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe Tamara, if you can go next. Thank you very much, Leah, and thank you very much to the IDB for the invitation. And I would like to start off on the basis of something that might seem very obvious, but that we tend to forget how obvious it is. Integrity is always a challenge for organizations. Although it might seem very simple to say that we have to follow integrity is like the initial point of departure to do things uh, that are correct, the basic uh, principles uh, that are faced uh, by organizations and businesses uh, permanently. It might seem obvious, evident, essential, basic. But when you bring it to practice, it is not always like that. It is not uh, so basic, so essential to be able to harmonize uh, the interest uh, of all those uh, who come together within an organization. And in this uh, taking the words uh, that you addressed, Leah, as well as uh, what Nancy just said, uh, it is a challenge that is not exclusive of the public sector. It is not a challenge that is exclusive uh, to the private sector, but necessarily, it ought to lead us to establishing a healthy relation that we establish between two worlds, the public world as well as the private world. An ethical business behavior we clearly understand nowadays is a means in order to build an organization that uh, will be stable and remain in time. Without that, uh, we will not have sustainable organizations uh, in time. And therefore, nowadays, integrity has been transformed uh, inside and within businesses into an aspect uh, that generates a value that is required by society as a whole. And therefore, nowadays, we are much uh, stronger talking at an international level about the importance of uh, bringing in another aspect that, that uh, as I said at the beginning of uh, my statement, it is obvious and basic that we have to follow integrity. Who doubts uh, that, that we have to be full, wholesome as a businesses, as an organization and have integrity. But when we're faced uh, with a certain dilemmas that many a times are not simple, they're not easy to solve. And if they're not easy to solve, during these days of a pandemic, it is much more difficult to solve them in situation of emergencies. When you have a crisis, we all understand that civil freedom, civil liberties come into play with certain contradiction or they clash with certain fundamental human rights that have to be subjected to common interest, individual liberties, individual freedoms. And in a way, we're perhaps uh, much more flexible in order to analyze and to solve certain situations that, that under conditions, under normal conditions, we wouldn't do. Now, it seems to me that, uh, and here there's a trap. And nowadays, in particular, all businesses, 
be it public organizations or private organizations, and must pay attention to that, not to fall into that trap. Why? Because nowadays, when we're willing and ready to overlook certain freedoms as civil liberties, we could say that uh, we could end up uh, being loose, because obviously, Skipping the rules and not uh, abiding by them is easier than uh, sticking to the strict procedures that are imposed uh, by protocols, uh, by regulations, by codes of ethic uh, inside uh, these organizations. Therefore, when we make these exceptions to a rule, we could end up uh, staying there with this uh, taste of uh, wishing to achieve uh, soon a quicker result. And what we have to avoid uh, at all costs uh, is to transform this very popular saying that the end justifies the means. No, by no means. The end could justify the means that are used uh, in order to achieve uh, that uh, end. Something very different is that in this situation of a pandemic, an emergency, that we'd be able to skip a few rules, but with transparency, with agreement between the different uh, parties involved. Because if not, when tomorrow comes around, uh, when society, when the citizen will assess us, they will assess us in a normal situation with eyes uh, of a normal situation. And maybe it will be much more difficult to understand that certain decisions were made in a context in which in the future, we won't even have this in uh, our eye, in the retina of our eye. Therefore, it is essential that during these times of crisis, we do not neglect this search for integrity at all costs. If nowadays uh, the business sector, in a way, is under suspicion, under permanent suspicion, this, to my mind, is a huge opportunity that it has in order to show, to prove that significant changes are being brought about, uh, that they're not uh, putting the end or the way how they arrive at that end above and beyond a behavior with integrity. That is what I can say for the time being, what I can bring to the discussion, obviously awaiting the interaction with the other panelists and with the participants. Thank you very much, Atamara. Well be, please. Thank you for this opportunity. And well, I'd like to start off by highlighting the opportunity that Walmart has had during this crisis of bringing two elements, an essential service in all countries, the distribution of food, which has been acknowledged as an essential service, and therefore the stores were kept open. And at the same time, as a responsible for helping generate economic opportunity and economic uh, stimulus and incentives that is so desperately needed uh, currently because of uh, the strong recession that we face in many of the markets where we operate. And it is in that context that I wish uh, to underscore four elements of the special challenge posed for all of us uh, that have the job of forcing compliance with the laws. One is internal, one is an internal challenge in the sense that uh, we facing this crisis calls uh, for experimentation and speedy implementation of uh, many new ideas in a very new context. And in any case of action, new action, innovation, we see how compliance or problems arise because we're doing things that we have not done in the past that, that bring with them new ways of 
having relations amongst the different stakeholders relating amongst each other. And that is why the lesson is that what we need is a culture, compliance culture, and a compliance system, a system that will have to quickly learn, just like the entire company is learning. But if the system is not there as the foundation, as a basis, then at a time of a crisis, there's very little time to put it in motion. And therefore, businesses such as Walmart that, that have invested in a culture and a pre-existing system before the crisis have an advantage in being able to support the, the compliance function with all the innovation of all the other functions of the business. Secondly, we have an external factor. Likewise, civil servants face the challenge of changing what they're doing. And many of them are not in the office. In spite of that, they have one part of an activity, an essential activity. And I give you the example of the construction industry. In almost all countries, it has been seen as an essential service, but one cannot build without permits, without licenses. And if civil servants are at home without the possibility of using digital tools, then that activity in spite of how essential it might be cannot move forward and on top of that civil servants see many of their stakeholders and our stakeholders facing a lot of needs and therefore there's a danger an external da danger of falling into a state of millions of a special status instead of a, a rule of law. Having a special condition as an exception to the rule of law is a danger for compliance. And once again, to have as a business a system, a protection system, a code or a culture of compliance, which helps us precisely then to relate to and to talk to civil servants on a regular basis and in a normal way, in spite of all the new things that uh, the civil servant uh, sees. The third point is that undoubtedly there's a huge backlog in many sectors, delay very well illustrated in the public sector of a lack of investment in digital tools. If we were to have a better digitalization of regulatory systems of the state, we could have moved forward with economic stimulus above and beyond what we've seen so far. I've already stressed uh, the case of uh, permits and licenses that might be digitalized, but uh, very little work has been done on that. And now we need it, but it's not there. It's not available. So that is the third idea that stems from the crisis that we have to invest strongly and quickly in digitalization of the main systems of the state that will make it possible to have investors, not shuttle ready projects where everything or every civil servant uh, wants in uh, situations of an economic uh, recession. And the fourth idea is that this uh, provides us with an opportunity. It is the Hernando de Soto moment, as we call it, in the sense, well, de Soto talked about this idea that we have to wait and see where we 
put our foot on the grass. And there's where you have to build the roads. In this context, we've seen this. People are stepping on these digital tools. They don't have any other option. So we now need to, to build the infrastructure and set up the rules that combine well with the new world, forced new world that is digital. This is an opportunity for both sectors, but it's an opportunity in particular, and I want to thank the IDB for all of the work carried out precisely in this area. In transparency fund investments in businesses, e-government and many other contexts. And additionally, within the context of the business dialogue. Thank you very much, Welby. I'll get back to the issue of the importance of adopting digital technologies. It's a key item that we need to embrace. And this crisis has led us to discover new areas that we've fallen uh, very heavily behind it. So now we'll move on to our next uh, panelist. Good morning. Speaking of technology, I think we're all experiencing a huge change regarding what's happening in our world and we're having to transition into a new world. How many of us who have never met can suddenly be connected in real time? And so this leads me to believe that the challenges that we face when working from home or when trying to conduct the work that we need to do. And this leads me to think about this concept of integrity. Corruption implies not only the commission of a crime, but also implies a concept of ethical or moral generation. When we start to see any failures in any of these two issues, ethics or morality, we start seeing some fertile ground for corrupting, corruption and corrupt practices. And so the presence of this crisis that makes it imperative that people need to address new challenges despite the, the regular workload that they normally undertake. And so we need to try to continue to be the same person in every role that we are called upon to play. And this allows us to maintain consistency because today's crisis is an ethical crisis, which is accented because at the present time, behavior is much more visible. And in addition to that, technology ensures that many of these actions can no longer go on without being noticed. So if you say commit some kind of a, an aggressive act against your spouse, this is something that's gonna be well known. Many homes are touched by technology and this can be a very good thing and it could also help in providing support for this type of inconsistency. And that's the concept that I wanted to highlight on today. How is it that we can ensure that a person always behave as one and doesn't react in a strategic way in the face of different roles that they have to play. And this is where the code of conduct is very important. This is where the code makes us be in full compliance of the adopted ethics. Uh, many of these ethics have a historic and conceptual background. We've seen uh, great contributions on the part of humanity towards the creation of this code. And how do we adopt this code in our daily lives? How can we be better people? Well, we need to be able to decide between right and wrong. And this is something that we didn't used to have before. 
and we need to be able to undertake this personal exercise by using this code that has a great deal of value and at the corporate or organizational level it needs to be adopted for its value and this will serve to incentivize people to behave in a proper manner i think that we are living an essential time at the organizational level and so we need to be able to present a new coherent and integrated image to the entire organization. In Latin America, as well as the rest of the world, we are trying to come up with a more conscientious capitalism, a more ethical capitalism, so that we can avoid the different types of capitalism that uh, serves to impact people much more than to serve people. So we need to take advantages of the good aspects of the free market and the opportunity to gain wealth, but we need to always be mindful of the pitfalls. And so this requires a tremendous degree of awareness and we need to be able to establish a new image, a more proper image for our organizations. And we need to look for the most consistent ways to achieve this, to adopt these values that are deeply ingrained in this ethical code. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eduardo, what you just mentioned reminded me of something that I heard at some point. Human beings are by nature good, but when we are controlled or when we are not, but, but when we are taught or when we are educated, we can be even better. And this leads me to other things that were mentioned by Tamara and Nancy. There are a number of concepts that surround the fact that integrity and ethical behavior should emanate from each one of us in a natural way, but it doesn't necessarily happen that way all the time. And this is a time that has put us all to the test. And getting back to Tamara and what she mentioned, it will be a real pleasure to leave this crisis behind. And in, there is always that trap to be, that we face in trying to do things in a more easier, more rapid way. And she mentioned that Many times breaking the rules is easier, but I would like to add that it is truly easier to break the rules, but only in the short term. If we consider the long term, we see some problems when we have this short term mindset because we don't really see the consequences of our actions in the long term and we end up paying for them as a result. So I'd like to get back now to Nancy Uh, the code of ethics of AdvaMet has long set the standard for ethical interactions between healthcare uh, professionals and member companies. And uh, from what I know, the code of uh, ethics basically provides medical technology companies with guidance based on what would be six cornerstone values. Uh, and I think these are related to innovation, education, integrity, respect, responsibility, transparency. And uh, from what I know, at the beginning of the year, uh, you updated the code to reflect the needs of a rapidly changing world, of a rapidly changing industry. Um, and of course, I'm sure that when your team was designing this new and updated code of ethics, uh, you never expected uh, to be a part of an industry that is right at the center of a crisis. And not just any crisis, uh, but one of great magnitude, great impact, social impact at all levels. And across the world right now, there is a huge demand for medical supplies, uh, medical solutions, and a great amount of resources are being directed to medical supplies. And at the same time, we are also witnessing a great deal of cases where, uh, unfortunately, those resources were not properly handled. So my question to you in this context and in the context of your company, 
uh, and in your view, what is the role of code of corporate conduct? And how did, for example, the recently adopted code of ethics work for Advamet in this uh, highly unpredictable scenario? And what are perhaps the lessons learned uh, during this COVID-19 crisis that you think need to be considered in the design of future uh, codes of ethics? Nancy, please. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you for the introduction to the Advamed Code of Ethics. Um, I think uh, to answer your question, I'm actually going to refer back to what both, well, what everyone's been talking about, but specifically um, Welby and um, Eduardo both referenced the importance of compliance and a culture of compliance. And uh, it generally in the compliance profession, we're seeing a transition away from a rules-based guidance towards principles-based guidance. And um, that um, transition is reflected in the new version of the Advamed Code of Ethics. Um, there were a number of reasons why we updated the Advamed Code of Ethics. Um, one was to take into account uh, new technological advan advances and also just some new uh, business models that have come into place since the code was last updated more than 10 years ago. Um, but a big part of our discussions uh, as we were redrafting uh, the code um, centered around this transition from uh, rules to principles. And uh, we feel like if you have a code that is based based on principles and um the Bogota principles actually um, were inspirational for this approach, quite frankly. Um, you internalize certain concepts and um, those concepts can be applied when a crisis like this arises. If um, there's nothing specifically written down, um, you have these principles that can guide um, your behavior within a company. And um, compliance professionals and um, business leaders um, will be able to consider um, new scenarios through these principles. So I thought I would take a minute and just um, walk through the principles themselves and uh, then talk a little bit more about how we have worked to apply those to the response to the COVID crisis. Um, as um, as you mentioned, um, the code itself really does focus on the relationships between the companies and the healthcare mm -hmm. practitioners. Um, these relationships are um, vital to the successful use of medical technology. Um, oftentimes, um, doctors and other healthcare professionals will be involved in the innovation process, either helping a medical device company develop a new device or develop a new technique or develop an improvement. Um, those relationships um, make a lot of sense. Um, they, if a doctor comes up with a new invention, that doctor should be compensated. Um, but we want to make sure that the compensation is not excessive and doesn't create a relationship um, that has um, either a corrupt intent or a corrupt effect. Um, um, similarly, um, companies need to be engaging with healthcare practitioners in order to train on their um, the use of their medical equipment, the which ones to choose, how to use them effectively. Um, again, this creates close relationships. Sometimes um, companies will have uh, training opportunities um, where they need to bring uh, medical professionals in. Um, we want to make sure that those opportunities can go ahead um, without um, creating um, an opportunity for corruption. For example, you don't want to um, be having have your training um, at a lavish resort where you give out, um, you know, all sorts of uh, excessive prizes and things like that. You want to have your training in a medical setting, ideally, that is conducive to receiving the training. Uh, so the first principle is that of innovation. All of the relationships that our companies uh, get involved in are designed to advance the development and availability of safe and medical uh, technology, um, so that medical um, practitioners know how to use the equipment and also that the equipment itself is developed with the best advice that we can receive. Uh, this is related um, to education. Um, uh, the medic, all of the companies that sign under the code um, commit to deliver high quality training and education to help ensure that the healthcare professionals can use medical technology. Um, that commitment to high quality training and education is very important to our industry and this is you get involved with more advanced technologies, it's even more important. Um, perhaps most important to our discussion today um, is integrity. Um, this was a this was a new element that we brought in. It's something that has under been an underpinning of the code for a long time, but we hadn't spelled out in exactly these words. Um, our companies commit to conduct their business with integrity at all times and avoid real or perceived conflicts of interest with healthcare professionals. Um, related to this was the the new. Um, fifth principle, which is that of responsibility, and we had a lot of discussion around this. Um, our companies commit to promote socially and ethically responsible business practices that protect patients, their rights, and their safety. This goes beyond that tight focus on healthcare practitioners to say that all aspects of our business should be uh, conducted with um, 
a consideration of social and ethical norms. Um, finally, I'll just mention the last two, um, respect, to respect the independent clinical judgment of the healthcare professionals. Um, they are the ones who are deciding the best way to treat patients and um, our, all of our um, company representatives that interact with them commit to um, allowing that discretion. And lastly, transparency. Um, this gets back to what Eduardo was talking uh, about as well, that um, everything is visible now um, and we commit to it being visible. Um, all of the relationships that our companies um, mm -hmm. are involved in and um, our, we commit to documenting them and um, making those available to full review, making sure that um, all of these interactions are um, conducted fairly openly and transparently. Um, so those are the, the principles that our companies have signed on to. And um, we uh, hope and believe that they do guide a broad range of activity and give um, officers uh, the tools they need to address um, specific um, incidents as they arrive. Uh, we, ha we at AdvoMed do quite a bit to um, educate on these principles. Um, we have a board of directors that is uh, rather large and cross-cutting, reflecting the, the diverse nature of the medical technology industry. We have a committee on that board that is the ethics committee. Um, that is led by CEOs, and um, at every board meeting, we talk about the code of ethics. Uh, that culture of compliance, you hear it all the time, that it needs to start, start from the top. I've heard a lot of discussion, more so in recent years, about you have to have tone from the top, tone from the middle, and uh, buy-in from the bottom. Uh, but it is important. Um, it's important to have these leaders visibly supporting uh, these high standards of integrity. I have heard CEOs talk about uh, the need to make adjustment to bottom line projections if it, that's what's necessary to ensure um, going forward in an ethical manner if some business practices need to be changed. Um, that is very inspiring and it gives a lot of uh, confidence to those that are um, on the front lines, on the Salesforce front lines. Um, regarding um, COVID-19 in particular, um, we um, rather quickly um, pulled together a group, as I mentioned earlier, to develop some guidance specifically related to uh, the response to COVID-19. Um, we, um, as you all have talked about, this desire to move quickly and to um, come up with inventive solutions uh, to the new challenges. Um, our industry is known for innovation and we pride ourselves on being nimble, but um, when you're moving really fast, that can create some risks. So we, um, we got together and we developed some guidance to try and help companies address those risks. And we start off uh, just by re reiterating our commitment to um, helping address the healthcare crisis, bringing the best equipment to the patients as quickly as possible, making sure that the healthcare practitioners have the training they need, um, but also noting that uh, the need to move quickly does not override the need to act ethically. And what many companies have, depending on the size of the company, some have very complex approval processes in place for things like donations, um, for things like sending volunteers. And um, we recommended that uh, companies consolidate that as much as they can. They, to streamline the process, they should develop a single point of contact, ideally a committee, and on that committee should be a compliance representative. Because that's what we've seen um, happen quite a bit is you get the business team together and there's nobody there from compliance or there's nobody there from legal and they move full speed ahead with a solution that um, may make sense when you're first talking about it, as Tamara alluded to, but may not actually make sense um, sort of once the crisis is passed. Um, so I would say that is one of the most important recommendations to come out of this guidance is to make sure that um, your rapid fire response team includes somebody from compliance, just to make sure that all the issues are being addressed. And the companies have responded very well to that, um, especially if the business team sees the single point of contact, the single committee as speeding uh, their response, they are happy to use it. And uh, they have been happy to make um, adaptations that need to be made. Um, there's a number of things that are specific to the medical technology industry, um, particularly related to donations of equipment and um, training venues that we spend a lot of time on. And I won't spend a lot of time on it here because I know not everybody on the line is a medical technology expert. Um, but I'll just talk about donations briefly. Um, of course, it makes sense to donate uh, needed equipment to hospitals and uh, PPE, the personal protective equipment, um, all these things. And um, one thing that we've been very careful to emphasize is to make sure that that's being done fairly. Um, we don't want um, companies to be donating 
excess masks to their best customer because that's not appropriate. We want to make sure that the people who need it the most are the ones that are getting it. And again, that's a fundamental underpinning of the AdvoMed code is that when you um, provide anything in terms of donation or training or whatever it is, it should not be designed to um, inappropriately influence purchases of product or reward past purchases of product. It needs to be free of that influence. And that's something we consistently emphasized uh, through our response to the crisis. And um, we believe that it has had an impact. And that, and finally, I'll just close on a very boring point, uh, but just within our industry, we've also encouraged a lot of documentation. Just document all of these practices as you're going through them. Um, sometimes when you write things down, they look a little clearer than when you're just talking about them. And um, also just as we move to the post-crisis phase, if all of the um, decision-making processes and relationships have been appropriately documented, they'll be much easier to um, assess uh, in the light of day. So um, I think I, that's all that to say is that we um, do feel like the corporate code of conduct is in a very effective response um, to this kind of a crisis, especially if the development of that code of conduct involved a broad sector of your industry, as ours did, and especially if that code of conduct is alive and part of frequent discussions. Uh, we found that once companies are involved in developing the text and once their leadership is involved in frequently discussing it, uh, we do see more of it implemented. Uh, so I'll just pause there and um, I'd be happy to hear from my other panelists and of course entertain any questions. Thank, Thank you. you so much, nothing, absolutely nothing boring about what you just uh, discussed. Thank <laughs> you so much, really enlightening. Um, Tamara, um, quisiera ahora que hagamos un ejercicio de... Tamara would like for us to do uh, an exercise to try and place ourselves in that well-known day that we've been all talking about, that we're about to start a career, and we're talking about this model of ready, steady, go, and we're talking about the economic reconstruction of our respective countries after the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, when we talk about transparency and integrity, I'd like to ask, what risks are you expecting in a post-COVID context what challenges are you going to be facing as organizations after the crisis? And what can we do to ensure that these valuable tools are not perceived to be a problem, like a pebble in the shoe or some other kind of issue? Thank you, Leah. The first thing I'd like to say in response to your question and I think it has a great deal to do with what Nancy was talking about regarding the function of the ethical code. And, and again, it's something that appears to be very obvious, but the existence of an ethical code does not guarantee the existence of an ethical organization. I mean, the code is something that's written down on paper, but it's far removed from what an ethical culture is. And this is something that relates to the manner in which organizations do things, how they relate to each other, as well as with third parties or stakeholders. And the expansion of this ethical culture need not have any boundaries, especially restricted to the organization, but rather have to extend beyond the organization. Now, when we talk about the existence about uh, the existence of a code of ethical code and that not necessarily translating into the existence of a culture of, of ethics, then we see that there's a huge temptation to want to copy successful ethical codes that have worked for other organizations. So getting back to what Nancy said, I'm terrified that many medical field organizations are gonna just wanna copy the AdvaMed code of ethics and try to adopt it without really putting it into practice. And so the idea is we have to create a subset of values and principles that need to permeate the entire organization. And that's what we need to document into a code of ethics. It will be the guiding document that will provide oversight for everything that we do. 
all the processes. And that's the risk here, because there are some companies that are gonna come out of this much stronger. And one of the temptations will be to just copy that copy instruments that have been useful and, or have provided some results for some organizations, but that haven't been really adopted or developed by them. Now, when we talk about the risks that we expect uh, after the pandemic, I think one of them is historical. It's present right now. It has been present in the past, but I think it'll still be present at the moment when organizations start to see that their coffers are a little bit more empty. But this is something that we cannot for, forget. The power that money or drug trafficking or other types of crimes has and the power that it has to corrupt others will clearly knock on the door of those organizations that have been weakened by the pandemic. And I think that this is something that we need to consider and be aware of with eyes wide open to be able to alert the relevant authorities and organizations as we start to see some of these monies that are obtained in many instances in an illegitimate, illegitimate way. And many of these are offered as a, as a life preserver to organizations. And so we need to pay more close attention to the principles behind the code. So we need to remember that the end does not justify the means. We cannot become trapped by the idea that's easier to obtain an economic result by breaking the rules or by avoiding them, by doing things that are not ethical. And we may be able to achieve some economic benefits, but we will be sacrificing a lot. And so this is not guaranteed over time. So the call for us to try to avoid this seductive temptation once we start seeing organizations open their doors, the temptation to connect to criminal organizations will be great. And we need to be very strong and we need to be in full contact with the relevant authorities to ensure that we do not allow these practices that cause so much harm, not only to the organization that falls into that trap or that succumbs to the temptation, but it also causes a tremendous amount of harm to society at large. And it leads organizations to do things that are not desirable. And of course, this affects any sustainable development mechanism or goal that we've been working on for a long time. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamara. This last point that you mentioned about thinking about anticipating the ever-growing risk that is engendered with the, the current situation. When we talk about challenges to integrity, they're always present, as you stated quite correctly. We have very strong organized crime in our respective countries. And what you mentioned was very interesting because this is something that we need to give a lot of thought to and we need to reflect extensively on the issue of vulnerability, not only for people and families, but we also need to think about how we avoid creating a setting for the festering of this type of activity or practice. So I'd like to move on now to Welby and say that many companies believe that uh, once uh, the ethical and corporate conduct code is adopted or written, they think their work is done. But 
as we've all heard, um, this is only the first of many baby steps that need to be undertaken to really create a, an ethical culture. So we've seen also the um, vicious cycle of collusion concept and and at the heart of this discussion that you were mentioning, I think this is a concept that many of you discussed, uh, shared responsibility, and Fabricio really pointed to this as well. And this poses that many organizations or individual governments play a key role in jointly driving the common good, the common good that goes beyond the benefits to the organization. So within the framework of your vision, how do you believe the interaction between the public and private sector would work, especially when we talk about permits or licensing? And how do you believe that we can ensure that this relationship and this interaction be both transparent and beneficial to both areas? And lastly, what solutions do you believe could facilitate us conducting our practices uh, in a rapid and effective way? And what solutions can be brought about through the use of technology to be able to be in full compliance with integrity? Thank you very much. Wonderful question. I love it. And I do stress the fact that that compliance is in its essence a relation between two sectors. And uh, therefore, we see a relation and a shared responsibility. And uh, the interface or the transparent interface between these sectors has uh, three elements, uh, three shared uh, elements. And I try to put everything in words that begin with a C in Spanish. So we have the four C's, which is knowledge, capacity, and commitment, all shared. And in Spanish, these are four words that begin with a C. So I could add an additional, a fifth a C. So the question would be, how are we going to generate that knowledge or that capacity and commitment, shared knowledge, capacity, and commitment. I see this um, as uh, advancing or moving forward uh, through competition. That is to say, creating a structure of incentives within business areas or regulatory areas, uh, incentives in favor of uh, competing on the basis of knowledge, compliance, uh, capacity to comply, commitment to comply. And to see this uh, as a competition, collaboration, and also competition, or to cooperate in favor of competition so that uh, we can all move forward uh, in their knowledge and ability or capacity to commit. This is what we've attempted to do in the America's Business Dialogue with uh, several recommendations that go to the core of your question. And I stress uh, two amongst the many that we have. And in fact, I recommend uh, that uh, you all see the entire report uh, that came out in 2018. And uh, that was not the end of it. Uh, with the help of uh, Fabrizio and his entire team and others, other areas of the IDB, we are moving forward with the early adopters, with other governments that wish to move forward uh, with these recommendations. But I stress number five and number eight. And simply for you to see that the relation and shared responsibility in the relation between number five that deals with the responsibility of the private sector and number eight that deals with the responsibility of the public sector, 
done with the assistance and the support and the help of the private sector. So number five is uh, to incentivize the private sector to adopt uh, comprehensive mechanisms in order to protect uh, integrity, including codes of corporate uh, conduct together with an effective implementation and a periodical review of compliance plans. That is what this panel is about, and we're talking about that. But what, how is this related to number eight? Well, number eight deals with bringing about a code of best practices for a civil servant and a public entity in favor of digital transparency in a regulatory environment that is extremely important for anti-corruption, which is granting permits and licenses. In my first comments, I mentioned how important it is to have digital tools in that context. So digital tools in themselves generate new incentives. What is digital is more transparent and thus it generates new incentives in favor of compliance. But the work in structuring good incentives cannot end with that. We have to wonder where do we find these knowledge gaps, this, these capacity gaps, and particularly what is the most important thing, the commitment, which is what is truly missing in Latin America, this compliance. Where do we find these gaps? And I identified two of them. One is, and I give the example of Chile, of a former minister of the economy at the time he was a minister who said that, and this was when I told him that we had problems in getting permits and licenses in a predictable way in Chile at a subnational level. And instead of saying something on the defensive, he said, I know it is a continuous frustration for me because for him, he saw this as a priority at a national level and an area of a lot of work, a lot of progress, but a sub, at a subnational level, not so much. And that is why we see many of these gaps and what we need is incentives, tools that can close the gap to have the will, the capacity, the commitment at a national level on the one hand, and at the subnational level, it could be the other way around of a lot of a subnational will and not so much at the national level. Because ultimately, a project or a stimulus, an investment stimulus does not move forward at any level of government if they don't get the permits because of a problem of corruption or request for bribes and other problems in the inefficiency that is generated because of corruption issues. Another gap is between the political level and the level of implementation of policies line uh, servants, uh, because many times there's a lot of will at a political level, but the civil servant does not move forward towards that level. Then how do we create an incentive using digital tools in order to fill these gaps that weaken knowledge, the capacity to have shared commitment in favor of non-regulatory systems such as granting permits and licenses. The idea that we have in number eight, in recommendation number eight of the ABD, the America's Business Dialogue with the assistance of the IDB, is to structure 
a certification. Certification on the basis of what? Well, professionals. Postgraduate students that may wish to join public service and they want to hire me. That is competition in favor of doing something better, that the compliance work. So that student obtains his certification to be able to win again on the basis of good compliance and capacity and commitment in favor of compliance. Two candidates to the position of the mayors can obtain certification in favor of good practices or best practices in digital transparency in granting permits and licenses. But the work does not end with individuals only because the other element that generates incentives, the competition in favor of greater knowledge, capacity, and commitment is to extend that certification, not only for individuals, but for entities in the public sector. In an average municipality, we have 14 entities granting permits. Then we're talking about a lot of entities and giving these a certification of five best practices in digital transparency that the private sector, the members of the business dialogue have recognized as effective in generating or in bringing about a positive change in favor of anti-corruption and competitiveness, which brings with it knowledge for the entity, which enables it uh, to compete uh, with uh, its peers, just like uh, the business in the World Bank uh, has uh, done, which in fact includes a component, uh, which is construction permits. Then that is the work we're doing now we have identified five best practices in digital transparency. We see this as the point of departure in favor of building and structuring a regulatory system for licenses and permits that works with anti-corruption. And that certification that you can obtain as an individual or as an entity leads to incentives. You can have the benefit of being ranked as number one in being able to say, yes, I do comply, I have the certification. Then I simply conclude with an invitation that I extend to all the policymakers, as civil servants, and all those who surround the civil servants in all countries in the hemisphere. We are involved in that work in the American Business Dialogue with the several governments at a national and subnational levels. There are resources of different types and we also have very positive cases, cases we can learn from. So if you're interested in moving forward with this issue, it is a shared responsibility. You can count on us, uh, on the private sector, at the many levels of resources in order to help build together a system to grant the permits and licenses where we can relate with each other in a correct and digital fashion. Thank you very much. Very interesting uh, well be what you mentioned. And very quickly, I'd like uh, to rescue this concept that, that, that digital tools 
are exactly that. They're tools that will enable us to catalyze changes in favor of greater integrity, greater transparency, greater competitiveness, but they will not do our homework. We have to do our own homework. And this idea of having the adequate incentives is a key task. And without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Eduardo because we are almost running out of time. So Eduardo. Taking into account uh, the fact that in a number of countries in Latin America, they've legislated uh, some of these actions uh, under the criminal code. Given the situation in Peru within the criminal code, what has the legal framework uh, under the criminal code done in terms of impacting the situation and what advice do you have uh, with to other countries that are looking to do the same? Thank you, Leah. I'll try to be as brief as possible. First and foremost, we need to take into account the following fact. Uh, if we, we can't just have a compliance model out of fear. It should be based on conviction. When we based everything that we do on fear, then we're creating a situation where the justice system will never provide access to it. So we know that illicit practices take place and we need a, an appropriate system to address this instead of uh, trying to hire a, an attorney to deal with this. So response cannot be merely directed to ensure full compliance, but it needs to operate with conviction and it needs to, at the end of the day, create a positive result. Of course, we need to take into account legal limitations and for this we need to draw a very clear line. There are certain things that the law permits and other things that it does not. So we need to engage in extensive training. We need to insist on trying to apply corrective action that the persons understand the limitations and what the potential benefits as well as consequences could be when faced when, uh, with a decision that is difficult. If they decide on the wrong thing, then they will need to face consequences. So we need to be very clear with people to explain the reality of the situation to them and explain their limitations. So we can have situations where there's a scandal and there's always a scapegoat or somebody who's blamed, but we rarely see somebody who's accountable. We never see somebody who just steps forward and says, I'm the one responsible. So I think compliance has a key role in all of this. There is no doubt of that. And beyond inundating the courts with many cases or many procedures, we need to try and achieve some semblance of balance. I don't agree with uh, using draconian measures, very drastic laws. These don't tend to be very good incentives for dissuading people from uh, embarking on illicit activities. Now, when we have uh, different instances such as a death, a homicide, we have uh, clear-cut rules that address those types of cases. But if we wanted to talk about an effective uh, prevention model, we need to establish a set of standards that is intelligent, consistent, and necessary whenever it applies. But it shouldn't have to be a standard that's required by law. I think that standards are required when it's necessary to regulate something, and this goes back to something that Welby was talking about related to uh, the permitting and licensing structures uh, that exist in different countries. So there may be an incentive that we can create in the licensing and permit issuance uh, systems. Now there's another situation that, that's described by a word in English that 
does not exist in Spanish. And we're trying to find responsible parties whenever it's appropriate. And we need to demonstrate that the law will be applied in a drastic way when any illicit activity takes place. And it's also very important for us to persist and persist and persist. The only thing that really informs people and drives them to think before they act is a continuous and constant reminder of both the benefits and the consequences of their actions. So we need to try and inculcate in society uh, best practices. We have people that can have better information and better capability to make decisions, and that will lead them to not make uh, poor decisions that can lead to severe conflicts or rather consequences. Thank you very much, Eduardo. I'd love to have more time to be able to get more questions from the audience. We have one from Federico, who's in Argentina. And this is a question for the panel. I'd be very grateful if you each dedicated only one minute to answer the question, please. Once a company adopts a code of corporate conduct, based on your experience, what would be the key steps to implementing this code and ensuring its effective application? Any advice you may have? Let's begin with Nancy once again. Thank you so much. It's, it's my pleasure to respond to that question. Uh, once a company adopts a code of corporate conduct, what are the, the key aspects to ensuring its success? Uh, there's a lot of literature um, about how to actually get your code implemented. And um, I'll just say, um, I'll go back to what I said before. A lot of it has to do with tone from the top. Um, also, a lot of it has to do with getting that broad-based buy-in throughout the organization. So ideally, if you can have um, a multifunction team that puts together the code of conduct, you will have a set of advocates within all the elements of the business unit, and that will greatly enhance its success. So aside from getting the um, buy-in throughout the organization, um, either in developing the code or um, actually assigning champions within each business unit. I've seen that done before. Uh, the tone from the top is critical. Um, then next related to that is training and education. Um, you need to train all of your employees on the content of the code and this ideally should be custom to customized depending on their function. Um, we have an overall training course that we've developed that's suitable for any member of a company and then there's kind of a deeper dive version of it for sales force personnel um, that goes into specific scenarios and things like that. Um, and then uh, finally, you really, much like we've been talking about today, we need to, you need to, within your company, align the incentive structure to promote adherence to the code. Um, you can't have aggressive sales targets that depend upon unorthodox business practices and expect your code to be followed by the people who need to be following it. So the bottom line, uh, the sales projections, those need to be aligned with what you expect, the behavior that you expect from the employees. And uh, that's a big decision. And it's a decision that needs to you know, to be taken by the business team as well as the compliance team. Um, you can't in these days um, get a code aligned, adopted uh, just by, you know, threatening punishment. Um, we've also seen incentives built in in terms of people being rewarded on their performance review. Um, we've also seen kind of creative compliance awards also help enhance um, compliance. But um, in my experience, what I've observed the most success comes when you really align the firm's bottom line um, with the expectations and communications from the top. Thank you so much, Nancy. Tamara. Well, I have a vision that's a little bit different. I think that in order to ensure the successful implementation of an ethical code, I think that everything needs to be done beforehand. I think that a code can only be successful after having been created through a participative collective process involving every level of the organization. So any possible contingency in the application will be 
addressed in the code because every stakeholder, every level of the organization was involved in the creation. There are sometimes necessary additions to the content uh, given certain business areas, but if we want to have organizations that practice integrity at every level with every member, we need to ensure that everybody takes part in the creation of the code. Thank you, Welby. Well, I think I've already spoken too much to give Eduardo a little bit more time. I'd like to say that I'm fully in agreement with this idea of making the process very participative. We should call to representatives from various levels of the organization to take part in the design of the code. And of course, any incentive set or any incentive that can be included to add value to the business areas that actually adopt and put the code into practice, then we could have a reward system to incentivize all the business units to ensure that they not only comply with the code, but they do so willingly. Eduardo. Well, I agree with what Tamara said. All standards need to be established based on consensus. We need to take the opinion of all participants into account because at the end of the day, the application of the code will have that same tenor. We need to include the psychological elements. Uh, and when people are asked to fulfill a set of standards, they need to understand the reasoning behind the code. Many times uh, when organizations try to attach legal principles. I mean, I think it's more effective to make the situation from a conceptual standpoint and make it much more simple for people to understand. Many times uh, certain ethical codes are hard to read because they're too technical. Clearly, training is absolutely fundamental in trying to create this mentality organization-wide. We need adequate leadership by the management of these organizations, and so the leadership needs to serve as a guiding light for the entire company, and if the leadership is going to be creating oversight or providing oversight for the code and its compliance, then they need to set the example. Thank you very much uh, to all of our panelists. I think that the discussion was extremely enriching and I'm sure that all of our audience members agree. I'd like to yield the floor to our colleague Roberto Michele for some closing remarks. Roberto, go ahead. Thank you very much, Leah. And thanks to everyone. Don't be scared. I'm not going to summarize all of the things that were discussed because there are too many. They were all fascinating. But I'd like to pose a couple of ideas that weren't developed as explicitly but that I believe to be important. The first one that I think is very interesting and that I thought that all four panelists agreed on is that the, these elements do not have to just exist in a formal ritual way. They need to be put into practice, they need to consider all of the levels in the business organization. It cannot be a dead document. It needs to be a living document. It needs to be exemplified in practice and needs to be consistent, especially when we face difficult times such as the one that we're currently experiencing and in circumstances where the situation and the challenges are extraordinary. The second conclusion that I take away from this discussion is that today we have the advantage that technology can be on our side. Technology can help us do many things. As many of you stated, technology can help us to move great obstacles, especially when identifying illicit practices, but it also helps us identify good practices, mechanisms that use good practices, best practices that can help to resolve certain challenges, especially during times of crisis. The third element that I'd like to close with is that 
What I think was most interesting is that companies or organizations are deciding not to compete when it comes to integrity. They can compete on price, on services, on the quality of their products. But I think that the uh, America's business dialogue or needs to demonstrate is that we don't have competition when we talk about integrity. This is something that we all need to set aside as a key component of our operations. So we need to do so equally. I really appreciate the efforts that you've undertaken to translate uh, these principles into collective action and have done so to ensure that any organization, any business, regardless of its size, will have the necessary standards and tools to be able to fulfill their development goals and do so in a transparent and ethical way. With nothing further, Leah, I think this was an excellent panel. We look forward to sharing much more information based on the number of, ex of questions that we received. And on behalf of the bank and 160 audience members, I think that we were all very pleased with the conversation and the discussion. And so if any of you are seeking a potential career with a show on Netflix, I think you show a great deal of promise. So I wish you good luck and thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to participate. Muchas gracias a todos por la invitación. Un placer. Gracias. Adiós. Gracias. Gracias a ustedes.